right, well, I hope you guys are all ready to have your minds blown right now. How many of you guys have turned around and looked at that person behind you in the OR and like, what are they doing there? You know, you see this black blood all of a sudden turning red and you're like, is Harry Potter in the room or something? Well, don't worry, I'm about to explain all that to you right now. So first off, I'm going to just start off with some highlights, um, some historical facts. Dr. DeBakey actually developed the first roller head uh, in 1931. Uh, Gibbons developed, uh, uh, developed the first uh, cardiopulmonary system. Uh, he used it for, or actually used the first cardiopulmonary system successfully in 1953 to repair an ASD. Uh, Lalil and uh, DeWall developed uh, the heli first helical bubble oxygenator. Um, they also came up with, the, uh, DeWall also introduced the first hard shell uh, oxygenator with integrated heat exchanger, and uh, which later led to the development of the membrane oxygenator by Lillet. So those are just some historical facts. And here's a quick overview of what we're going to cover. So the first thing prior to going on cardiopulmonary bypass is obtaining uh, adequate uh, anticoagulation. And to do that, we want an ACT of around 300 to 400 units uh, 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 in AC, uh, seconds. Uh, and we give 300 to 400 units of uh, uh, heparin, uh, units per kilo of heparin, in order to achieve that ACT of 400 to 480. The reason we use heparin is because it's titratable, measurable, and reversible. Uh, very easy, very common to, to use. So for cannulation, the cannulation sites typically for this, on the right side of the heart, uh, we cannulate the SVC or IVC. Uh, it really depends on what kind of procedure we're doing. Uh, we'll do bicable cannulation for any procedure that requires us to open up the heart. Um, if it's just a cabbage, uh, straightforward procedure like that, we'll just do a dual stage cannula in the right atrium and that should provide, provide sufficient drainage for us. Uh, for aortic cannulation, we usually, or arterial cannulation, we usually go into the ascending aorta. Um, as far as uh, the other sites of cannulation, uh, uh, you can also do peripheral cannulation. Uh, the reason to use peripheral cannulation is if you're doing a minimally invasive procedure where you're doing that small incision and the surgeon can't uh, have the cannulas up there in that site, uh, he won't, uh, they'll take, take away from his visualization. Uh, also, if you're crashing on the pump in an emergency, best, way to, best and quickest way to get on bypass is peripheral cannulation. Uh, another, pl another side of cannulation, like Dr. Ramlawi mentioned, is axillary cannulation, uh, commonly, commonly used for ascending, ascending aortic aneurysms. Uh, by cannulating, if you, don't have, if you don't have actual access to the ascending aorta because of the aneurysm, also it allows us to deliver anti-grade cerebral perfusion, uh, depending on if we're going to have to circ arrest. Uh, right here, I just have a couple pictures of some of the cannulas that, that are commonly used. That top small one is an aortic cannula. The second one on there is a double t or a triple stage cannula, which would go in the IVC. Uh, those two longer cannulas right there are femoral cannulas. Uh, the shorter one on top would be a, a femoral arterial. The, one, the second one would be a femoral venous cannula. And like I said, just the surgical procedure dictates uh, what cannulation we would use for that procedure. And this image right here is just showing you some cannula, um, more venous cannulas, just showing you the, uh, where the drainage comes from. So after, can after cannulating the patient and we connect to the patient, we usually connect to the patient using some tubing, 3 eighths, 3 eighths inch or half inch tubing. Uh, we drain, we'll drain the patient, patient e either using gravity or assisted, assisted venous drainage, uh, which would be either kinetic assist or vacuum. Uh, a lot of that, the type of drainage you use depends on what type of system you use. After draining the patient, volume comes, comes back into your venous reservoir. Now your venous reservoir essentially is the body of the patient. It's going to hold the excess volume. Uh, that excess volume just holds up there until we're able to return it to the patient. Uh, certain, different patients have larger blood volumes. What you see in the image, you'll see a hard shell reservoir and, a, and then on the side, the one with the blood in it is a soft shell reservoir. Uh, you'll most commonly see the hard shell reservoir in most institutions. Um, reason for that is it has all the ports. It doesn't require any external reservoirs. Uh, the soft shell off actually offers a big benefit as far as safety. If you're not, for some reason, not paying attention and you drain that reservoir, you have the afforded benefit that that will collapse for you and keep you from pumping air to the patient. So here's just a general, general picture of what the circuit looks like. 
on the tips there, you see the cannulas, which are inserted into the patient's heart. Uh, connected to that, some tubing, which goes back to your reservoir. And then if you just follow the whole process, you go through your pump, your oxygenator, filter, and then back right back into the patient. The pump heads, the pump heads used for these are, are, to, are centrifugal and roller heads. So now the roller head was the one I said was developed by Dr. DeBakey back in 19, uh, 1930s. Uh, that's a positive displacement pump and afterload independent. So that, that, was, that was the pump back um, first starting out. That was the arterial pump head, you know, that was most commonly used, which was later replaced by a centrifugal head. Now, positive, the drawback to positive displacement pumps are if you occlude those pumps, they're going to continue to turn, continue to build up pressure, and somewhere usually in that circuit, you're going to bust bust open or something like that. It's gonna, that weakest point of that circuit's gonna explode on you. Now, when you go to a centrifugal head, you have a pump that's not putting as much uh, pressure, sheer pressure on your red cells. So what that centrifugal pump does is just creates a vortex, expands, sucks in the blood, propels it forward, sends it back to the patient. Uh, only downside, r real downside to a centrifugal head is that over time that pump head can heat up and then cause cell, red cell damage in, in that regard. But other than that, the centrifugal head, centrifugal head is usually the gold standard when it comes to cardiopulmonary bypass. Right here, I just have a couple of images for you of the, of the pump heads. Uh, you can kind of see the inner makings of the centrifugal pump in the, in the uh, left or right hand corner. And then on the other side, you can see a roller pump. Uh, at the ends of each of those roller heads, you see it compresses the tubing and pushes it forward uh, and propels it back into the patient. Now right here we have the oxygenator. This is the magic that I was talking to you guys at, at the beginning of the case right here. So the blood goes into your oxygenator through the heat exchanger at the bottom. Uh, all, oxy all oxygenators usually come with an integrated heat exchanger. Uh, we hook up an external water bath to that which will allow us to cool and warm the blood reducing the patient's metabolic demand during the case, depending on where we're at in the procedure. After it goes through that heat exchanger, it goes through those fibers in, that, in the top part of that, which is the oxygenator. Your oxygenator is a hollow fiber, mem is a hollow fiber membrane. Uh, that membrane helps separate, helps separates the blood and gas uh, inside. Now you want that separation of the blood and gas, that way you don't have that way uh, you don't have direct contact causing hemolysis or, and you help reduce the risk of releasing microemboli, uh, air emboli back into the patient. Uh, this image right here gives you just a little bit of an uh, image of what the inside of that membrane actually looks like. Um, now that membrane is good for about six hours while you're on bypass. So after that, after that period of time, it starts to break down a little bit. Uh, and you, yeah, during that time, you, uh, if you start seeing hemolysis happen, you might see plasma-free hemoglobin, so you might see the patient's urine start turning a little bit red. Uh, but typically these membranes hold up very well over time and allow you to get through your case with no problems. So gas exchange with these oxygenators is based off of Fick's law of diffusion. Basically we're pumping in oxygen on one side. Uh, that oxygen moves across the membrane to the lower to the side where there's lower concentration of oxygen which is inside the blood although the blood has a higher concentration of CO2 so you have the re inverse relationship on the other side where the CO2 is going to cross over into into the gas phase of the um, of your oxygenator until you, both sides reach equilibrium so right here this is how we deliver you'll see the silver part on there that that's our blender right there uh, it allows us to dial in what percent of oxygen we want to deliver to the patient. Uh, the other side, the clearer side, is the flow meter, which just dials in how much oxygen we want to, or how much we want to uh, deliver in liters. Right there, we have an external heater cooler that hooks up to our heat exchanger. Uh, that heater cooler, um, you'll see various different heater coolers at whatever institution you work at. Uh, right there is the SARNS 3000. So cardioplegia, right here on cardioplegia, there's usually two sites for delivery. You can deliver anti-grade cardioplegia, which will go down the cor coronary arteries, um, or retrograde, which will deliver backwards through the coronary sinus. 
Now where you see that balloon inflated in the heart right there, that's the retrograde cardioplegia cannula. That balloon inflated right there is to keep the cardioplegia from flowing backwards. That way we can actually deliver it retrograde through the heart. Right here, right, right below that cross clamp, you see a, a, insertion, a needle inserted into the ascending aorta. That's where anti-grade cardioplegia is, delivery, uh, is typically delivered. Uh, you can also, if that aorta is opened up, uh, deliver that cardioplegia directly using uh, osteo cannulas. Uh, just an option if you have an extended, if you have a case which is uh, going on for an extended period of time and you want to give some anti-grade. Anti-grade is uh, great for protecting the whole heart as opposed to retrograde which will, which doesn't protect the right heart as well because not, not all the blood empties out, uh, uh, not all the blood uh, from the heart empties out through the coronary sinus. So the way cardioplegia works is that it causes diastolic cardiac arrest and it does that using a high potassium solution. Uh, the, reason, the reason that we want to arrest the heart during, this, uh, during the procedure is because of AT, AT because of the consumption of ATP during the cross, during the cross clamp procedure. Uh, along with the byproducts of anaerobic metabolism that build up, for example, lactic acid, all of those things when that cross clamp uh, come off the heart will cause um, redu reduced contractility, um, increased uh, myocardial stunning, uh, can sometimes lead to um, potentially an assist device having to be inserted you know, just, just so the heart has enough time to recover following the procedure. So the reason we arrest the heart is to try to prevent, prevent those things from happening. Uh, there are different, different variations of cardioplegia. Um, the main component, as I said, is potassium. Uh, some of the most common cardioplegias that you'll see in your institutions will probably be Del Nido, um, is, which is, which is one, one of the best solutions, gives you up to 90 minutes of arrest time. Uh, you'll also see uh, four to one car um, cardioplegia delivered in a different manners. You'll have four to one cardioplegia, uh, one to four, uh, straight crystalloid. Uh, what solution you use is really surgeon, surgeon preference. Um, biggest thing to take into account of what type of cardioplegia you're delivering is how much dilution, hemodilution you're going to cause over time, so how often you're going to have to give that throughout the entire procedure. And that's all I pretty much have for you. I hope I solved the mystery of cardiopulmonary bypass for you.